Okay, good. You can uh, can you see my screen and still hear me in the meantime? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, good. Uh, we have uh, quite a packed agenda, so if you don't mind, Nicola, I will I will uh, start straight away. Um, but thank you very much for the the introduction. Um, so yeah, who am I maybe to uh, to uh, to give this uh, this session on on supply chain strategy and and how it should be linked with SNOP? Um, so actually, before meeting Nicola, I started my career as a demand planner at uh, Spadel. So that's a, a Belgium fast-moving consumer good company uh, where I was doing uh, forecasting and demand planning. Um, after that, I joined uh, PwC a bit more than 10 years ago, started uh, there together with uh, Nicola. Uh, and since then, I've done more than 30 different projects in, in the field of supply chain planning, including a couple of uh, SNOP projects. Um, I was also um, giving uh, a, a day training on supply chain strategy in SNOP, a day and a half, actually. Uh, that I try to condense as much as possible for this webinar. Uh, so I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, and next to my uh, consulting life, I'm actually also teaching at university. Uh, so there I'm teaching uh, supply chain management in second master. So I have a bit more than 200 students there. Uh, and next year I will be launching a sustainable supply chain course for postmasters. Uh, so that's about me. Uh, and yeah, next to that, uh, in the coming months and year, we will have uh, a couple of other sessions around SNOP. Um, my colleague Dennis, Ali, or colleague Dennis, will be speaking about very practical tips and tricks that you can use. Uh, Dennis used to work as well at PwC, but he has worked as well a lot in the industry. Uh, he started as an OP in, uh, at uh, Philips Lightning. Uh, he was also a uh, supply chain director in a pharma company in Belgium. So he will really give some, some practical tips and, and from, his, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from his industry experience. Uh, then we will do a session on uh, SNOP technology, uh, uh, and that will be given by Peter. Uh, Peter uh, used to work for OM Partners, uh, so one of the most well-known uh, advanced planning systems. Uh, and he will explain how technology can make or break uh, uh, an, an SNOP project. Uh, and finally, Jerome has a more financial angle, uh, and he will explain how you can move from um, SNOP towards IBP, so integrated business planning, and also include sustainability in that, uh, in that equation. Okay, um, I hope you can still hear me, Nicola. Uh, are you still Perfect, alive Nicola. and goes works? Okay, good. Um, I will continue. Uh, don't worry, uh, this session uh, will be interactive as well. Um, I typically like people to ask questions during the session, but uh, uh, considering the amount of people following the webinar, it will be complicated. But I will be uh, uh, using a tool, uh, WooClap, to uh, get the interaction. Uh, but before we go into the um, different exercises, I think it's good to remind you what is sales and operations planning. So sales and operations planning is typically in between two different layers that company uh, master quite well. Uh, the, the first one is the strategic layer. Uh, uh, so their companies make typically long-term plans uh, on, on um, where they want to expand, uh, where they want to produce, uh, where they want to buy their products from and distribute. Um, they're also very good at operational planning, uh, very day-to-day -day, uh, scheduling uh, and deployment of certain goods. But then in between that, uh, we have a tactical layer uh, where SNOP is really making the link actually between that strategy and that operational layer. Uh, SNOP also enables actually different functions to work together uh, as, the, uh, as, as the name is stating, sales and operations. Uh, the initial idea is really to um, have people from sales and from operations around the table, but it's broader than that. Uh, we, actually, uh, we actually also have finance, marketing, and a lot of other functions. The idea is really to foster the collaboration within a company um, to balance supply and demand. Um, um, nevertheless, 
Uh, um, we see that in companies, even quite mature companies, um, there are some problems in that sales and operations plan. And uh, that is actually caused by a fundamental misalignment between the different functions. Uh, so um, I've seen in a lot of companies where sales and operations actually look at the same problem from a very different angle and uh, do not agree uh, and are fundamentally misaligned. Um, and why is that? Because they do not have the same understanding of the corporate strategy. Huh? Um, they have a different perspective on, on what is the, 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 the strategy of the company. And that's why I always like to start an SNOP training with that strategy part, because if the strategy is not clear for everybody, um, then you will uh, eventually end up with problems in your SNOP process. Um, and a good way to clarify the strategy of a company is actually to use the competitive strategy. So what the heck is a competitive strategy? Uh, a competitive strategy is actually um, why are your customers selecting for you as a company rather than your competition? Huh? So why are you beating your direct competitors? Um, and uh, to analyze that, actually, uh, Tracy and Wiersema have a very uh, easy framework to use. Um, and um, to have a strong competitive strategy, there are actually three different strategies. Huh? Um, the first one is what we call operational excellence. Huh? And operational excellence, the, the value proposition is really to have the, the best total cost. Huh? So it's really um, having a good price quality uh, ratio. Um, and the golden rule of that strategy is variety kills efficiency. Um, but I would like to hear from you uh, what kind of company uh, is actually into that operational excellence bucket. And to do that, uh, I would like you to scan the QR codes that you see on the right. Uh, so that's a link to uh, WooClap. Um, another option is to go on uh, the WooClap website and to type the event codes that I have over here. If you want, I will also post up the link within the chat that will be easy uh, up, up. expand sorry i'm not that used to uh nicolas would you be able to put the the link in the chat yeah i'll do that right away ah, fantastic okay good so i can go back here um, so I hope that in the meantime, you can, uh, you can access it. People can also scan it with their smartphone. It works really well. I'll just post the link in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Often if you have a smartphone, the easiest way to use it is just to scan the QR codes. Um, and if you want to do it with your laptop, you can just go on the, on the site. Um, but let's, let's have a look if it works. Uh, so, uh, if I start the, um, WooClap. I see some of you already um, putting answers. I see Toyota uh, for operational excellence. I see Aldi. I see Ryanair, Amazon, AB InBev, Pfizer, Zara. A lot of very familiar names. Huh? And yeah, the wide majority of those answer is correct. Huh? So if I go back, uh, you can you can still continue voting if you if you want to, but yeah, when when we are speaking about operational excellence, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the typical example that comes back is 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 Ryanair. Uh, uh, you will opt for a Ryanair because they have such an attractive price that yeah, uh, you will go to them and not to the competition because yeah, their, their price is typically half of the price that you can get somewhere else. And uh, that's really an operational excellence uh, strategy. Uh, they, they're really beating the competition because their price is better, uh, but uh, they make sure that they are as efficient as possible and that they only uh, propose certain lanes that are very frequent and that enables them to be efficient on those lanes. Okay. Um, 
Another strategy is customer intimacy. Uh, so customer intimacy is, is the best total solution. Um, and there the golden rule is try to solve the client's broader problem. And that's typically what we do in consulting. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of frameworks, but what we do is really to tailor those frameworks to the customer needs and try to really listen as much as possible and to adapt our work uh, towards really what the customer wants and to be as flexible as possible. Uh, another example is an architect, for example. If you wanna, if you wanna construct a new house, uh, that architect will first listen to what you want and he will design a house for you. And that's really customer intimacy. Um, and then finally, there's product leadership. Um, and there the idea is really to have the best possible products. Uh, um, and, and with that approach, uh, the golden rule is cannib cannibalize your, your success with, with other breakthroughs. Um, yeah, a, a very classical example of that is, is Apple uh, uh, with their iPhones. Um, they just beat the competition because yeah, some people don't want to buy something else than an iPhone because it's just, yeah, they believe it's the best phone that is on the market. An iPhone is just replacing his old iPhone with a new version of the iPhone. So they're really keen on innovation. Uh, so those are, that's a way to look at possible competitive strategies. Uh, and those are three typical strategies that can be used by companies. Um, so what I would propose for some companies, it's very clear. For other companies, it's not always that clear. So that's an exercise we do uh, when we start a project, uh, an SNOP project at customers. And often the first question is, where would you locate your company on that triangle? And so every side of the triangle is a different strategy. Uh, most of the company are not 100% just one strategy, but are often a combination of different parts. But so my question to you is, yeah, probably you all know the Pampers uh, from Procter & Gamble. Where would you locate the Pampers on that triangle? Uh, so I will... That's why you have to click on the button so we can start to vote. I can't wait yeah. to put my answer. Let's go. Yeah. So normally you can vote now. So the question is, is, is it really purely operational uh, product leadership? Is it purely operational excellence or customer intimacy? Or is it rather a combination of two or three different answers? Even bring the screen a bit bigger. I don't see the full title. Better like this. So I see. Try not to be biased by the other people, huh? uh, but I, I see already uh, some people selecting product leadership, some operational excellence. Some a combination of product leadership and operational excellence. Some a combination of product leadership and customer intimacy. So it's uh, quite some different answers. I see 80 people answered in the first place. So I will, I will give you a bit of extra time to answer this one. Yeah, try to give an answer. It's not, it's not an easy answer, uh, but um, yeah, just try your luck. So if I'm reaching 35, I'm stopping. <laughs> so if you don't have three more answers, it can be long. 33, two more people. 34, yeah. One more. Okay, 35, good. Um, so here, I don't know if I can rank them. Uh, no. Okay, uh, but so here in the first place, we see that we have a combination of product leadership and operational excellence. And indeed, uh, when I do such an exercise, I often ask uh, the, the participants to plot different companies. That's often where Procter & Gamble is located. Uh, so a combination 
of product leadership and operational excellence. But it's always a debate. That's why I took this example as well, because you will see that it's not always easy uh, to know where um, a company is located on that triangle. And even more surprising, within the same company, often you have different perspectives on the strategy of their own company. Uh, and, and yeah, often you have the different functions that have a, quite a different point of view. Uh, I've seen some companies uh, where actually often operations looks the company as operational efficiency, um, where they really push towards yeah, being as lean as possible. Whereas when you ask more the salespeople, but they look themselves more as customer intimates or, or product leader. So of course, yeah, if you're not aligned uh, between the different functions in the company, that creates frictions and that creates problems. So at the end of this exercise, the idea is really within a company to come towards an agreement of what is the competitive strategy of the company and to make sure that all the functions are behind that same idea. Um, nevertheless, what we see is that in some cases, um, some people say we are actually in the middle. Uh, and I see some of you answered that, uh, the answer number seven. So it's a combination of everything in the middle of the triangle. And that's dangerous. And that's not good uh, because strategy is all about making choices. If you're in the middle of the triangle, we call that um, stuck in the middle. And that's something we absolutely want to avoid. And that's something I've seen in some companies. Um, and so, yeah, to go actually one level deeper and to avoid doing that or to just go a bit more in details in that exercise, we use a second exercise called critical success factors. Um, what are those critical success factors? Um, with those critical success factors, we will ask the people to rank what is most important within a company. Because typically when you ask people, uh, and, and, and mostly the salespeople, what is now most important, they will tell you everything is important. But uh, with such an answer, it's complicated to create a strategy. So there we will actually force the people to tell us yeah, to rank the different factors. Um, so I, and actually in those critical success factors, you will see that some of the factors are actually not an issue in your business. Uh, so for example, Apple, the price is not an issue. So we don't have to really go full force on that price aspect on, or the operational efficiency within supply chain, because some of the, characteristics are actually not so important. There are other critical success factors that we call order qualifiers. And order qualifiers means that you need to get to a certain minimum threshold to be able to compete with the competition. Huh? So for example, um, yeah, you need to be under a certain price to be able to compete with your, with your competitors. Nevertheless, price is not really the thing that will make your customer come towards you and not to another company. So there you just have to do the bare minimum, but that's not what is going to make you win. What is going to make you win is what we call the order winner. Huh? And that's really the focus your company should go towards. Um, and, and, and that's really important to master and to be better than your competition on those order winners. Yeah. And to understand a bit what are those different parameters, uh, we have those critical success factors on the right side. I will rather quickly go through the different factors. I have aggregated some of them. Uh, there are more than that, but for the sake of time, I try to condense them. Um, but yeah, I, I will list them. And then once again, I will ask you to apply that to the Procter & Gamble case and the Pampers and ask you, yeah, what do you believe are the critical success factors that are most important for PNG? But I will first go to the different, uh, the different characteristics. So the first one, quite easy to understand, that's the price. Huh? So having a low price is really what enables you to be the competition. That's typically the order winner of Ryanair. Huh? 
Then there is everything around delivery, uh, having a fast delivery or a reliable delivery, uh, uh, making sure that you, you, you can um, order very fast. Uh, that's one of the order winners of Amazon, for example, or having a reliable delivery. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you're doing some renovation works at home uh, and you can have an entrepreneur that is reliable, probably that can be a very strong critical success factor of him. I'm not sure to always be the case, uh, but so being reliable can also be really a differentiator. Um, then there's quality, and there are two different types of quality. There's, uh, first of all, quality compliance. Uh, so that's making sure that you always have the same quality. So for example, if you go to McDonald's, you go anywhere around the world, you will have the same taste of your burger. So this is a quality compliance. Uh, if you're doing auditing as well, you have to make sure that you comply to a certain quality. Uh, and then you have quality level. Um, that's really the intrinsic value of a product. Uh, so if you go to a, to a three-star restaurant, you go for the taste of, 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 uh, of the food. That's really the, the, the quality level of a product. Um, then there's flexibility. And there again, you have different uh, possibilities in flexibility. You have a mixed flexibility. Uh, that's a wide range of products. Uh, if you go to that uh, customer, can you have a very large assortment of products? Um, you can have also a, a product a flexibility. So uh, is that company ready to customize the product for you? And then there is a volume flexibility. Uh, are you uh, willing to adapt the quantities and being flexible? Uh, are you only selling a full truck or are you okay to go to a pallets or can you buy just a unit? And that's, that's a volume flexibility that you can have. Um, and then the last ones are quite straightforward. So I won't spend too much time on it. So innovation, uh, can you bring new products or services on the market? Service, uh, if, you, if you sell products, can you... Uh, are you providing also um, adding value, uh, value added services on top of that? Uh, and then the experience, uh, we see um, more and more that uh, companies are not selling products or services, but they sell an experience again, that can be also a, a, success, a, a success factor. And last but not least, because it's quite important for our Procter & Gamble case, but it will not be in the ones you can select, accessibility. Uh, so if you go to the supermarkets, uh, yeah, can you find the Procter & Gamble um, uh, pampers? Yeah, if it's always the case, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a success factor. If you're not on the shelf, uh, but people will just buy another type of pamper and too bad for you. Um, I hope you're still alive. Um, Nicola, are you? Yes, are we you? are. Okay, good. Um, but then I, I would propose to yeah, vote for what are now the most important critical success factors of Procter & Gamble. So I've listed on the right side um, the list of those critical success factors. Um, so you're free to vote, uh, try to um, yeah, rank the different critical success factors. What do you believe is now most important for those pampers? And again, that's not an easy question. Huh? So um... five is the highest rank or? Yeah, five is the maximum, one is the lowest, yeah. So in the meantime, I see some questions in the chat, I hope. I took the time already to answer a question in the chat, so it should be okay. Ah, fantastic, yeah, thanks for that. So I see just five answers. That's definitely not enough. So please take the time, try to think. But in the meantime, you can do the same for your company or, or uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a very good exercise to make because you have to make choices. Uh, you have to rank them and to compare them um, and yeah, to ask yourself what is really important for us and how do we stand out compared to the competition? Only five answers, that's definitely not enough. So I will wait at least for 10. Uh, so please take your time. 
if you have questions regarding the the critical success factors please feel free to, to just have a, a question because Francois, so normally when we give this training course we ask participants to rank their own company right the yeah. question i have is usually do people agree on what's the most important for the company or do they get into heated debates over what's important there are some debates, but what we do here is a bit the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, so it's anonymous and everybody can have his own opinion. Uh, but typically at the end, when there is a ranking uh, that is actually summing the, the, the input from all the participants, yeah, people tend to agree. Uh, for some of the parts, there are some discussions and that's normal, but still you will see that uh, the most important ones will pop up. But what's also interesting is, is the most important ones, but also the ones with low value, because yeah, sometimes uh, when you ask sales, they say that's important, but uh, when you put that in perspective uh, with, the, with the other factors, you see that it's not that important. So yeah, the, the high scores and low scores are, are interesting to understand, but most of the time uh, there are uh, people I tend to agree more with this exercise than with the previous exercise. Okay. Um, so, uh, good. So here, uh, looking at the answers, we see that quality is is uh, is the answer number one. Makes totally sense. Um, so those pampers, and I know it because I, I have a little daughter. This two and a half. I, uh, are not uh, are not for free, huh? so they're um, compared to the competition, they're, they're definitely not cheaper. Uh, but in terms of quality, uh, you are sure that yeah, it's uh, you will survive the nights uh, with a and P and Gene pamper. Um, yeah, so the the quality and the, and the experience of those pampers is it's it's also very easy to to put. Huh? Uh, and, and even in terms of innovation, it sounds weird, but Procter & Gamble is able to innovate into the pamper business. Uh, that seems quite weird, and I would never have said that a couple of years ago. Uh, but that's that's actually a, a correct answer. Huh? So we see there that yeah, then quality, innovation, experience, service is important. Price is less important. Um, delivery speed or reliability is maybe a little bit less important as well. Uh, so it's it's really all about the quality and the and the experience. Um, okay, good. Um, the question is now: Okay, um, once you have done those two exercises, normally uh, your vision on uh, the corporate strategy uh, should be a bit clearer, and everybody should at least look in towards the same direction. The next part is how are we translating that into a supply chain strategy or even how are we integrating that into our sales and operations plan? Um, and to do that, uh, what, what we typically do is that we translate those critical success factors in service level agreements. There are different stages. First, I would advise you to start with internal service agreements. Uh, so uh, kind of handshake agreements between sales and operations and eventually also different um, functions within the company. And eventually those as a lace, you can also make them external with your customers, with your suppliers um, uh, on, on really important, uh, on important matters. Um, so I, let me take an example. Uh, so um, availability, typically that's something that is extremely important uh, in the fast moving consumer world. Uh, so having a good on time in full or on shelf availability is really critical. Uh, so if the conclusion of the previous exercise was that, yeah, availability is really the number one order winner, then it's important to link a service level agreement to that uh, critical success factor. Um, and first of all, to have an internal uh, SLA, but also to have an SLA with your customers, because yeah, you will see that in the retail business, sometimes you even have penalties if you're not able to reach those targets and so on. Um, but uh, those SLAs, they actually should be different for different types of products or different types of customers. So what, what we advise or what I advise 
is to have a, a segmented approach. Um, and why is that? Um, I've actually experienced that most of the companies have a one size fits all approach uh, where you have one service level or you propose uh, one type of service to all your customers for all the products. Uh, uh, but actually it means that for certain very important customers or very important products, uh, you could actually propose a higher level of service because you really want to treat those customers or those products as gold uh, because they're very profitable or they have a very high volume or because those are key customers for the future. And so if you're sticking with one service level, uh, you're probably not serving them as well as you should. Uh. So that's why we typically then tend to have those A customers or that A segment uh, with A products or customers where we want to really reach a very high service level. Um, and then on the other way around, you will have certain customers and certain products that, that we call then C or even D sometimes segments that are not profitable uh, or very little profitable or that are generating a very small volumes and a lot of complexity for your business. And so sometimes you are spending an awful lot of time for those small customers and products, uh, but they don't deserve it, actually. Huh? And so that's why um, we then typically come with segments. Uh, you have a, a different parameters, different drivers that you can use to, to do that segmentation. But in the example I, I use for the service level agreement, um, I use volume and margin. Uh, so you could have four segments. Uh, so the first segment would be high margin, high volume. Uh, so that's our triple A customers or, or products. And there we say, okay, for those ones, we want to make sure that we have an on time in full that is exceeding 99% because those ones are really gold. On the other way around, we say, but. Uh, initially, we were giving 55%, uh, 95% to all our customers. Those small customers or those small products with low volumes and low margin or even negative margin, too bad. We will deprioritize them um, and we will actually aim for a lower service level. If we can do better, we will do. Uh, but if we have the choice between our triple A customers or even our B customers, they will get priority. Um, and that will really enable you to, but first of all, through those SLAs, to have clear agreements between sales operations and all the other functions. And, and you actually know uh, where to aim and which direction you are going towards. And that segmented approach really enables you to get the best out of your different products and your different customers. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, the next, uh, the next point is, yeah, so, so for the moment, it's only service level agreements. It kind of, um, carves in stone, the agreements between the different parts of the company. The next one is, yeah, but how are we going to set up our supply chain to fulfill those agreements? Huh? Um, and to do that, the first thing that you have to keep in mind, uh, that the objective of your company uh, if you look at purely from a financial point of view, I'm also very much into uh, sustainability, but I, I keep that uh, on the side for the moment. Um, the fundamental objective of, of a company is to make money. Huh? And the best way to measure that is to, to use what you call the, the HONA, the return on net assets. Uh, in other terms, it's actually what is the return on investment of our company? Uh, and to do that, you will compare different things. First of all, the margin. Uh, so the, the revenue that you make minus the costs that, uh, that your company is incurring. But you have to divide that as well by the assets that are required and the, and the cash that is required to, to, to make that profit. Uh, so you always have to keep in mind that all the, the, the decisions that you will have to take in your supply chain uh, have to be there to... Uh, foster that return on that asset. So having as much profit as possible and do that with the lowest possible of assets or cash required. Um, 
and yeah, there, there is quite a long list of, of supply chain strategy initiatives that you can do. Um, and you, we typically bundle that into the, the score model. Uh, so I, I guess most of you know that score model. The score model is actually, first of all, the, the sourcing part, uh, everything related to the, the, the raw materials. Then the manufacturing part, how we transform those raw materials in finished goods. Then there's the deliver part, and it's how do we transport those finished goods to the end customer, and, and where do we store the products, and how do we, uh, which mode of transportation do we use? And then the planning uh, layer on top, and, and that's 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 my focus and the one of Nicola as well, uh, is how can we make sure that we can glue those different parts together and that there is a seamless um, link between, uh, be between the different parts of the supply chain. And in terms of initiatives, uh, I will list, list a couple of them and, and I will highlight the first one. Uh, the first one is a, de uh, a decoupling strategy. So basically a decoupling strategy is where should I locate my inventory? Huh? And, and that's, that's something that you should actually do based on the, the, the service level agreements that we have determined before, and that is segmented depending on your customers and your, um, and your, uh, and your products. And so there you will really look into where should I place my inventory strategically? Uh, should it always be at the last note of my supply chain? Uh, so at, at the, the local distribution center or at the customer? Or for some of the customers, can I hold my product a little bit more upwards? Uh, can I have it in a regional distribution center or can I keep it even in my factory? If I, for example, uh, if you use a Procter & Gamble uh, and, and just the, the fast moving consumer goods uh, sector, um, they have more and more e-commerce. Uh, so before they used to store most of their products at the end of the supply chain, very close to the, the supermarkets, but knowing that now there is an e-commerce bit, more and more products are also hold earlier in the supply chain, for example, at the factory or at the, cent uh, at the, at the regional distribution center to actually fulfill that e-commerce part of, uh, of their customers. Uh, um, then there's a inventory optimization. First, we determine where we want to locate our stock. The second one is how much stock that we want to have. Of course, uh, the, the absolute master in that is, is Nicola. Huh? So he, he can have a very advanced models on how much stock you need. Uh, and depending on yeah, the, the different echelons of your business and how much stock you hold in, in one part, how much you need in the, op, in the other part. So the multi-echelon inventory optimization uh, that, that can also bring a lot of value and really support as well those service level agreements. Huh? Um, um, then uh, linked to the other parts of, of supply chain, but the, the strategic sourcing, uh, uh, where do I want to source my products from? Uh, does it come from the Far East or do I want to have some suppliers that are more uh, close to me? Uh, so, uh, so I can be a bit more reactive to, uh, to the demands. Uh, the distribution network redesign. Uh, so where do I place all my distribution centers? Uh, portfolio rationalization, uh, that's also something that comes back quite often. Uh, we see in many companies that there is a kind of um, yeah, product uh, proliferation. There are more and more products and we tend not to rationalize the portfolio, but for some companies that are customer intimates, having a very wide portfolio is important. But again, uh, there, with our service level agreements, we can say, okay, for my A customers, I will give a very large portfolio, but maybe for the other customers, there we wanna have a smaller portfolio. So being able to, yeah, really structure, restructure your portfolio can be, can have a huge impact on your supply chain, cost to serve, uh, so all the different parts uh, um, uh, that are, generating costs into uh, fulfilling the demand of your customer and the manufacturing footprint where you put your, uh, your, um, your production sites. Um, so digging a bit deeper in the decoupling strategy parts, uh, there, uh, for example, what you need to do in the decoupling strategy part, 
um, is to have a good understanding of the uncertainties that is surrounding you. Um, most of the uncertainty comes from the external world, but some of them are actually also generated by your own strategy. Uh, and um, for example, having a, a large uh, range of products makes the demand uncertainty bigger uh, because it, it makes it more complex. That's what we call implied uncertainty. Um, and, and yeah, uh, the supply uncertainty that can also depend on the strategy that you have if you want to outsource part of your business or not so that that that, that can have a, a big impact but fundamentally what you want to do is to protect you against that uncertainty uh, so when you look at the demand side um uh, so uh there uh, it's the other way around my apologies so it's actually the first one should be the supply uncertainty there, what you will look at, it's actually your bottlenecks. Uh, so what can you do to protect your bottlenecks and to make sure that they are treated as gold uh, and that you can run those bottlenecks 24 seven. Um, you will look as well at the suppliers that have, uh, that are unreliable. Uh, so there you will make sure that, for example, you hold, yeah, a bit more stock of the products with unreliable suppliers. Um, and yeah, that you make you make sure that you want to hold yeah a bit of buffer for those unreliable unreliable um, suppliers or unreliable production sites of yourself. So it can be external, but it can be internal as well. If you know that one of your production steps is very unreliable, it makes sense to have a small buffer stock after that step to uh, protect you against that uncertainty. And, and, and lead times, uh, if you have extremely long lead times for certain products, uh, sometimes it makes sense as well to hold a bit more stock uh, or to hold stock um, because, um, yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you fall into problems, you will have to wait very long to get those products. Um, if you look at demand uncertainty uh, there, you can look at the forecast accuracy of certain customers or certain products. Um, or if you don't measure that, uh, you can look at the coefficient of variation, but I shouldn't say that because otherwise Nicolas will not be happy. Um, but um, yeah, basically you really have to look into the, the, the volatility and the uncertainty of that demand. And again, try to protect you against that uncertainty. Um, and if there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, it might be wise to hold your stock a bit earlier in the supply chain. Um, and so you can share that risk amongst different products. Uh, and that's what we call the postponement strategy. Uh, so that, that can be very useful if you have a lot of uncertainty. So um, that is it for today. Uh, I hope you didn't all fall asleep. It's hard because I cannot see you. Um, but yeah, now we still have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so I will, I will stop presenting that. Um, so I will listen to your questions and then uh, what I also would like to have is yeah, your input on what you would like to know on SNOP because yeah, we have prepared an agenda for the coming months. Uh, but what you want to do is to answer your questions. Uh, so yeah, please let me know what are your burning questions. But first of all, I, I will answer the questions from um, for this session. So I will stop sharing up so I can see your faces. I see Nikolai is still alive. Uh, I'm definitely uh, still alive, yeah. Yeah. Um, any questions from the audience? We can either uh, type it in the conversation or uh, take the virtual microphone. We can then uh, discuss a bit. Yeah. So, what do you see as a research uh, opportunity in different slides that you shared? For example, in the coupling point positioning in supply chain, mm -hmm. based from your practical view. Uh, in terms of research? Yes, research uh, opportunity. Because yeah, when I, we are talking about where to locate uh, or the penetration point or the coupling point, so uh, we need to, there are some, uh, you know, uh, mathematical models or, you know, uh, experimental models that uh, can help yeah. companies uh, but, to do that. 
Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity in that because a lot of companies are good at determining how much stock we need. Uh, and then that's typically where Nikola is very good at, uh, to determine the size of the stock that you need on, on existing uh, decoupling points. We're also very good at the forecasting bits. But what's more complicated and where we're lacking a bit of research um, is the supply uncertainty part. Uh, because yeah, you really should put your decoupling strategy not only depending on the uncertainty from supply, but also from, uh, from demand, but also from supply. And having a good understanding of that supply uncertainty. Uh, but now uh, some companies use digital twins uh, to actually um, look at the transactions and to look at, for example, variation of your lead time, variation of the yields that you have from supply. But there I see a lot of opportunities, both in terms of research, but also in terms of software to have a better grip on, uh, uh, and a better understanding and visibility on that supply uncertainty. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Also, well, thank you very much for, for this and very helpful. Um, I have a question. So when you mentioned when you do the exercise, set the priorities for each company, uh, for example, in small companies that the management team is like less than 10 people. So mm -hmm. would you do that to the whole company to, to participate in the exercise or would be like the vote of the 10 people be enough? Uh, I did it for different sizes of companies. I've never done it with everybody from the company together. So typically I, I do it with the C-level or, or the people that are actually participating in the SNOP meeting. I think that's a good start. But if you have 10 people, yeah, you can do it with everybody together. That's that's nice because the good part of it is at the end of the exercise, everybody understands the strategy. And often when you go in a company, everybody has a, a totally different view on the strategy. Uh, they have their own imagination of, of what the strategy is. The advantage of this exercise is that it puts everybody into the same direction uh, and it opens discussion. So yeah, if you can do it with everybody, it's it's an excellent uh, an excellent exercise. Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you. Yeah, with pleasure. Also, we also have a question from Eleni on the chat. I don't know if you can uh, see it. Uh, what is the difference? Um. Huh. Actually, the, the difference between supply chain strategy and SNOP strategy, so uh, there, there is not such a thing as an SNOP strategy. Huh? So the, there is a supply chain strategy that should give the long-term direction of your supply chain. And if you're more a reactive supply chain or more lean supply chain with a lot of initiatives that you can do, SNOP is rather a process that helps you to balance supply and demand. Uh, and so SNOP really enables you to highlight quite some time in advance when you are in, in, in balance. So SNOP is really interesting where you are in a situation where the demand is higher than your capacity, than your supply, and then that you quite in advance try to see how can you better supply the demand that you're not uh, capable of supplying. So for example, how can I increase the capacity of assets that I already have? How can I build up some stock upfront if I have a very seasonal business? Um, how can I allocate my production to one site rather than the other? Uh, same for the warehouse. It's what's the typical flow that it should follow? So it's, yeah, SNOP is really a, a tactical layer that enables you to actually look upfront and to balance supply and demand. Uh, I see another question. Uh, so what's the role of marketing to play in SNOP? Any example of companies utilizing digital twin to assist uh, in SNOP? So um, role of marketing is quite important because marketing is part of the demand part. Huh? So, when you do as an OP, you try to have a good view on what is your production capacity or distribution capacity, so the supply capacity. And you also have, you need a good view on your unconstrained demand. 
okay? And so marketing will come with a lot of information like when you have promotions, um, um, yeah, when you have certain campaigns and, and those marketing initiatives or events will have an impact on your demands. Uh, hopefully they will increase the demands. And so it's important to capture that as an input to have a good view on, on the real unconstrained demand. Huh? And then if we constrain the demand with the supply, it's also interesting to have a feedback loop and to tell to marketing, listen, uh, at that moment you want to do a promotion, but there we're really short in capacity. Can you, would it be possible to do your promotion a bit earlier or a bit later? Or the other way around, at that moment in time, we have a lot of spare capacity. I cannot use, I, uh, there are a lot of people uh, that I have to lay off or that I have to put on temporary unemployment because I cannot use them. Can you do a bit of promotion so I can actually increase the, the utilization of my capacity at that moment? Uh, so that's often very useful in, in the seasonal business. Uh, so chocolate and so on, where you sell a lot in the winter and less in the summer. There you can really play with marketing to shape the demand. Um, uh, and the second question is, yeah, companies uh, utilizing digital twins. Um, yeah, there I think most of the, the, the companies that are quite mature uh, in the supply chain planning tend to go now towards digital twin. Uh, with Nicola, we were speaking about using a digital twin for a very big pharma company. Uh, and, and I think Nicola does a bit of research on, on the subject as well. Um, so most of the companies, I will not give names because I, I don't know if I can say that, uh, where I've seen that is, is, is pharma companies and, 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 and retail companies, but typically the, the a bit more mature companies. Hope that answers the question. Uh, so. Maybe to add one word on the digital twins, and we have here as well uh, our colleague uh, Alexandra Roquin. Um, what we are working on currently, and I announced that just before the webinar, is that we are trying to do internally uh, inventory competitions. We are all used to these, I mean, some of us are used to these forecasting competition where you take your demand data set, you try out different forecasting algorithms, you track different KPIs, and then you pick the best one. What we are trying to develop now, and I will um, share content and webinars on that later, uh, we're doing the same with inventory models. We're saying this is your demand data set. This is the type of suppliers you have. These are different forecasting models. We're going to try out different inventory models, and we're going to track which ones give you the best service level for the same amount of inventory, for example. So we really try to attack um, the business from we try out different inventory models, we try out different forecasting models, and we do a competition to see is it worth improving your inventory forecasting model further or should you be more into, could we improve the, the inventory model? So this is how we try at least um, the company here, our, our team here to, um, to use digital twins with inventory. Um, thanks, Nicola. So I see a lot of other questions. So I, I see one speaking about, is it more, important to go towards flexibility or to improve your planning. Uh, I think you can do them together. Uh, I think uh, improving your planning skills will only increase your performance, that's for sure. Uh, but if you are in an environment that is very uncertain, yeah, having a, a flexible way of working will definitely help you. Uh, if, if you have a lot of uncertainties and you're very rigid and you try to be as lean as possible, it will never work. Uh, so yeah, you have to make sure that um, you are adapted to the uncertainty of your environment and, and the, the uncertainty that you are creating yourself as well. Uh, but yeah, improving your planning capabilities, that can only be positive. Um, then, you, uh, maybe to just answer last question, I see the last one from Benjamin about how long does it take to implement the SNOP? Ah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, ha, that, that can be very different from a company to the other one. Uh, so for the moment, I'm working for one of the biggest uh, fast moving consumer goods companies in the world where we do a worldwide SNOP implementation. Uh, there, it, it will take probably years, uh, but we are speaking of implementing an, uh, one of the leading APS systems uh, where every country has to, uh, to, 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 to follow the same process. Uh, but you can be very pragmatic as well in the way you set up your SNOP. 
um, if you have yeah, important decisions that you want to take and you, you need to, to, to quantify that, you can just start focusing on one bottleneck that is core for you and do the balancing for that bottleneck. And little by little, increase the complexity and increase the amount of people that you invite in your SNOP. So you should not start very complicated. I'm actually very much in favor of starting small and, and growing little by little. Same goes for the tools. You don't have to go straight away for the most advanced APS systems. You can start in Excel and then go towards a more uh, like cloud-based solution. Uh, but it's possible to start small, to go in sprints and try to improve little by little your uh, your models and your process. Great, thank you, uh, Francois. We will stop here. I know you still have a question. I think you all have my email address and the email address of Francois. I'll, I'll type it again. Feel free to send us an email and we can, of course, uh, help you out and answer the, the remaining question. Uh, thank you, Francois, so much for uh, hosting this webinar. Um, Maybe then again, this if I can first. use the yeah. last, uh, so I, I would also like to uh, get your feedback uh, on what you would like to know for the next session. So, Nicola, you can maybe finish. Uh, I, I don't know if I can. I'm not in presentation mode anymore. So, if you can, yeah, just share uh, in WooClap what you would like to hear in the next sessions. That would be wonderful. And uh, Nicola, the floor is yours for. Uh, yeah, I will put yeah, back the, the link to WooClap. So I'm simply saying. So this is the first webinar on uh, SNOP, ABP, and integrated planning. Also, I hosted the first one. We will have soon uh, Dennis uh, sharing tips and tricks on SNOP, and then the rest of the team uh, presenting the work on technology and SNOP, and then SNOP integration with finance and uh, IBP and uh, sustainability. Uh, so we're going to organize these webinars over the next uh, few months. So let's stay in touch. I have your email address, so I will warn you when we do a new webinar. I said we still have to discuss internally if we will publish this webinar, yes or no or if we will share the slides. Um, as you might know, this is part of our main training course that Francois is doing for our clients. This is why uh, it's not uh, sure that we will share the slides. Have a great time, everyone. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any kind of question. It was a pleasure to have you on board. It's always a pleasure for me and for Francois as well to recognize some familiar faces in discussion and discussing with you. Have a great time. Bye. Yeah, indeed, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye, Thank everybody. Thank you.